It is the ultimate fear of everyday drologist, when perceiving phenomena beyond the meticulously crafted confines of the mundus, that one may become irredeemably altered by the secrets they uncover. For when you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. Just so, if you wish to accompany me on this journey, into the tenebrous depths of the chaos realms, I implore you to tread lightly, and to hold fast to that silent, inexpressible inspiration within you, that essence we so frivolously try to capture with syllables. For that is all you retain of your Adric animus beyond the starry shroud. As a final warning, I will tell you the story of the most daring daedrologist who ever lived, whose doom was as dreadful as it was destined. Morian Zenus was an explorer, a fairer of the firmament, a voyager tearing the veil between worlds. He was the spearhead in the vanguard of discovery. When the first conjurers cracked open the door to oblivion, they peered prudently into the darkness, fearful of the screaming horrors that loomed beyond the threshold. But Zenus was different. A glimpse beyond was not enough for the master of transliminal studies. He plunged headlong over the precipice, and set sail upon the waters of oblivion. In these outer realms, there were no suns to navigate by, no moons to guide the tides. Latitude and longitude would not avail him, for the laws of time and physics were unique to the Mundus. The Conjurer was an agent of order in an expanse of endless chaos, and as he broke the murky swells, sending spumes of creation before him, the Daedric Princes were ever watchful, amused by the brazenness of this mere mortal. But Morian Zenus was most zealous, and would stand dauntless before the Demon Lords. When Zenus embarked on his mission, he maintained one delicate link to the mortal realm, and that was a telepathic connection to his apprentice. Through this arcane connection, we learned much about Oblivion. The first word Zenus relayed back to reality was dust. The word dripped with enthusiasm. I can see from one end of the world to the other, in a million shades of grey. There is no sky or ground or air, only particles, floating, falling, whirling about me. I must levitate and breathe by magical means. Zenus had found the ash pit of Malakath. Next he came upon a frigid land, the sky alight with frozen flame. The ground is sludge but traversable. I see blackened ruins all around me, like a war was fought here in the distant past. The air is freezing, I cast blooms of warmth all around me, but it still feels like daggers of ice stabbing me in all directions. He was in the Lord of Domination's domain. The messages sent from master to apprentice were sporadic and fragmentary, transmitted to a place of order from the chaotic maelstrom of oblivion where time and space do not play by the rules of Auriel. One moment the Conjurer was recoiling from the harsh stones of Cold Harbor, spattered in blood and excrement. The next, he was in a land of overwhelming beauty. I am half blind. I see flowers and waterfalls, majestic trees, a city of silver, but it is all a blur. The colors run like water. It's raining now, and the wind smells like perfume. This surely is Moonshadow, where Azura dwells. But so much beauty was intoxicating, and his head swam with the glamour of it all. And then he was in a storm, spinning at the centre of a terrestrial kaleidoscope. Dark, twisted trees, howling spirits, billowing mist. But just before the vertigo could unravel his mind, the swirling was steadied by a flash of lightning. He was on a ship flanked by the walking corpses of his crew. Then the walls closed in on him. He was in a dungeon now. Tortured wails replaced the booming thunder. This was the formless quagmire of Veamina. The Queen of Dreams was adjusting the aperture of the kaleidoscope, embroiling the conjurer in a medley of nightmares. Next he said, I feel like I'm home now. Morian Zenus had wriggled free from Veamina's clutches, and stood now in an endless library, a leather-bound labyrinth, stretching on to the horizon in every direction. 
Untitled black tomes formed lurching towers, which grew ever taller until they toppled into illegible heaps upon the dust-caked floor. The conjurer walked for hours uncountable, picking up books on pure whim, rifling through their contents, and moving on. The extent of all that information threatened to asphyxiate him. So he emerged on the tip of a parchment peninsula, and gazed out at the roiling seas of ink. He was in Apocrypha, the abyssal archives of Hermaeus Mora. Xenus's apprentice waited anxiously for word from his master, but the conjurer grew laconic, offering only whispers, sent on faint frequencies. This cannot be, he would croon. No one would ever guess the truth. I must learn more. The apprentice implored his master to elaborate, but Zenus was unresponsive, speaking only to himself. I see the world, a last illusion shimmer. It is crumbling all around us. The apprentice cried out, begging him to explain what was happening, but the connection was fraying. The conjurer kept reading. He learned the fragility of reality. He discovered that for every individual action that occurred in reality, there were infinite corresponding actions that never materialized. Fate was woven from ghost threads, countless possibilities for every moment, yet there can only be one that manifests. Mori and Zenus tried desperately to convey his findings to his apprentice, but he was undergoing a strange transformation. He knew the Elder Scrolls could render mortals blind, but the forbidden knowledge of Apocrypha was having an effect on his eyes and his mind that the Conjurer could never have explained in a million synchronized lifetimes. He was not going blind. In fact, he was experiencing quite the opposite. He was seeing more and more. The words he read sent sparks of enlightened comprehension down the dendrite fuse wire to the cryptic conflagration in his brain. He began seeing double, quadruple, octuple, the exposure time increasing with every blink. By imbibing this forbidden knowledge, Mori and Zenus could see all the threads of his fate, both real and illusory. Whenever he reached a telepathic hand out to his apprentice, he found nothing to grasp. He had lost touch with the version of himself that was real, that had experienced his reality. Morian's apprentice still received ghost whispers at times, often years apart always by accident. The whispers were no longer intelligible. Perhaps he plummeted into the stacks and passed into the madhouse of Sheagorath. But in truth, Mori and Zenus had unraveled his own mind. The master of the tides of fate had even made his presence known to the fading mortal, a motley menagerie of squirming tentacles, probing pincers, and staring eyes. The conjurer had seen depictions of the prince before, Hermaeus Mora had always appeared as a confused jumble of appendages. Yet now, seeing with a thousand eyes, it all made sense to Morian Zenus. The great eye gazed into the conjurer's broken soul. Not even the glister witch Meridia could bring him back into focus now. Hermaeus Mora watched with an expression that might have been sympathy, as the last strand of sanity slipped free from the mind of Morian Zenus. Welcome, Traveller. My name is Drew the Daedrologist. If you've come this far, and remain resolute in the pursuit of this forbidden knowledge, despite the transliminal terrors I've described, then you are a worthy companion. Hermaeus Mora is the riddle unsolvable, the door unopenable, the book unreadable, the question unanswerable. But today, we are going to solve the unsolvable, and answer the unanswerable. The secret I plan to expose is one that the demon of knowledge himself had forgotten, erased from his own memory. Together we'll delve into Apocrypha, but in order to do that, we must familiarize ourselves with the lord of the land, Hermaeus Mora. I am the mystery at the end of existence. The first secret whispered at the dawn of creation. I am the guardian of the unseen, and the question unanswerable. I hold the knowledge forbidden, and untangle the threads of fate. I am the one who 
knows. I'll spare you a sermon on the origins of the universe and how the mortal realm came to be. But in short, our understanding of the gods and how to categorize them typically comes down to two denominations, Adric and Daedric. The Adra are generally orderly gods, anuic in nature, and they are the spirits who committed their power to the creation of the Mundus. The Daedra are those who did not participate. Adric equals our ancestor, Daedric equals not our ancestor. Hermaeus Mora's role is not quite so simple. Hermaeus Mora is believed to be of the Erdra, and in our universe's world building, Ur means original, primordial, earliest. In context, this title suggests that the Abyssal Cephaliarch is one of the first spirits to manifest in the Orbis. According to the Imperial Census of Daedra Lords, which despite not being canon, is a respectable source penned by Michael Kirkbride, Hermaeus Mora was born of the thrown away ideas used during the creation of mortality in the Mundus. I would argue, therefore, that Hermaeus Mora isn't as ancient as spirits like Namira, the embodiment of the void, the great darkness. But with the census in mind, Hermaeus Mora is in a unique position compared to his Daedric kin, for the Mundus cannot exist without him, and he cannot exist without the Mundus. Perhaps this is why in some cultures, like among the Khajiit of elsewhere, it is believed that Mora's realm of Apocrypha lies at the bottom of the ocean, an intrinsic part of the fabric of the Mundus. There is another reason Mora is closely associated with water, but we'll touch more on that later. I'll also delve more into the thrown away ideas used during creation notion as well, for it is crucial to understanding the importance of fate in the universe, and those tides abide by the motions of Mora. Hermaeus Mora has shown up throughout the earliest folktales on Tamriel, before those very cultures began keeping records of their history. Words are wind, and oral traditions are given new life every time they're spoken. Yet even in this formless state, the woodland man, Herma Mora, was there. The woodland man is the name given to Hermaeus Mora by the men of Oldat Mora. There are fragmented accounts of Isgrimor's encounters with the woodland man that survive from the Merefic times. One such account, called the Fragmente Abyssum Hermaeus Morus, recounts a tale of the Harbinger hunting in the frostwoods of the north. Beneath the snowy, coniferous crowns, Isgrimor met a long-eared hare, who offered the man longer ears, better for hearing his prey. But before Isgrimor could acquiesce, a fox appeared, the mighty god of mankind Shaw manifest. Shaw scared away the hare, who was actually Hermamora, and the fox warned Hori Isgrimor never to fall for the tricks of the woodland man, for accepting the hare's boon would have made him elven, along with all of his kin. But it seems Isgrimor remained fascinated by the woodland man, and it is no coincidence that this fascination is the reason why Isgrimor became the first human historian. The text titled The Onus of the Ogma states, In the late Merefic, the Nord culture hero Isgrimor developed a runic alphabet based on elvish principles, which enabled the written transcription of Atmoran speech. And the fragmented account elucidates, for Isgrimor made a plea to the woodland man, hoping to acquire knowledge denied. Isgrimor then dreamed he walked the umbrous halls of Apocrypha, inhaling concepts like smoke. He scribed what he consumed, but every word he wrote vanished with the writing of the next. He then gazed into an urn adorned with a curious finial. A mortal's fort organ floated within, grey and glistening. When he pulled his eyes away, he saw a corridor stretching on for eternity. The walls lined with plinths, atop each plinth an identical urn. When Isgrimor awoke, his tongue was bitten through. Soon later, this same hero became the first human historian. It's also worth delving into that name, the Woodland Man. Mora is the Elnifex word for wood or forest, and is often used as a metaphor in the Orbis. In my recent video on the land of Morrowind, I explained my reasoning for why the region's Guild of Assassins is called the Morag Tong. Morag Tong translates to Forester's Guild and I asserted that this is a metaphor for the role these assassins play in Dunmeri society. 
Writs of assassination can be issued by anyone against anyone, and it is the duty of the Tong to determine whether it is wise to take the contract. This process is almost exclusively pursued for political ends, and therefore, the Morag Tong tends to the forest that is civilized society. They prune overly ambitious shoots, preventing any one tree from having a monopoly over the sun-soaked canopy. In a similar vein, Hermaeus Mora is the woodland man, for his role in the realm is to monitor the burgeoning of fate, watching as fate branches infinitely in every direction. He is the gardener of men because he tends to these shoots of memory and knowledge. This forest is inherently deterministic, but since he possesses the forbidden information, he can influence the way these branches grow, allowing some, preventing others. He does this by revealing specific information, usually in the form of prophecies. Varieties of Faith in the Empire states that Mafala is Mora's brother sister, and while this can be taken figuratively, for they are both gods, and kinship only exists in the sense that all of the original spirits form themselves of the mingled essences of Anu and Padamai, I believe that this connection goes deeper because of what we've just discussed. Mafala is the matron of the Morag Tong. She taught the Kaima to use sex, deception, and assassination to get what they want, and the Morag Tong is the culmination of this manipulation. In past videos, I've asserted that Mafala is the spider pulling the strings of the universal orbic web. Using her secret arts, she can topple dynasties, create Tamriel altering legacies. In the words of Dive Fear, she does nothing without purpose, perceives all of Orbis as an interconnected system of action and consequence, and employs herself in spinning new threads to influence outcomes. This video is not about Mafala, so I'll stop myself from becoming cocooned in her allure. But when compared to Hermaeus Mora's ability to weaponize the spread of information, it is pretty clear that these two princes are cut from the same cloth. This notion of fate manipulation is at the core of what we'll be exposing today, for it has come to my attention that Hermaeus Mora has been abusing his power. Hermaeus Mora's realm of Apocrypha has always been shrouded in secrecy. In the words of the Telvani wizard Nelov, Many scholars and lore masters have been ensnared by the lore of learning the secrets that only Hermaeus Mora possesses. Like with Morian Zenus, anyone who manages to uncover new information about the realm tends to find themselves incapable of relaying it, enslaved by the desire for forbidden knowledge. But together we will dispel the mist of mystery. I have obtained one of Mora's black books, and by reading its cryptic characters, we may manifest in Apocrypha. The question is, will you join me? Within the hollow stipe of my mushroom tower, arcane candlelight paints the ridges of the fungal hyphae. The shadows flee to the thousands of circular depressions in the biotic chamber walls. Even the motes of dust freeze in trepidation as I place the black book atop the table. The tome fills the study with unspoken power. We fall into its orbit and feel the silent reverberations of its gravity in our bones. It yearns to be opened, as if the twisting tendrils upon its cover constrict around our curiosity, and its crude claws cut away our uncertainty. I take the book in my hands and open it. It yawns like a leviathan and belches hot delirium directly into our concept organs. Runes and hieroglyphs of every known and unknown language writhe before finally forming a legible procession on the page. The words lash at our brains, leaving welts of revelation. The eyes, once bleached by falling stars of utmost revelation, will forever see the faint insight drawn by the overwhelming question, as only the true inquiry shapes the edge of thought. The rest is vulgar fiction, attempts to impose order on the consensus mantlings of an uncaring godhead. And with that final word, the limbs of Mora pull us in, the black book crashes to the floor, and the room is left in darkness. For much of history, our understanding of Apocrypha has been rudimentary. We have descriptions of undulating inky seas, dotted with paper archipelagos. Stacks of books stand like trees, forming a labyrinth infested with eldritch abominations. 
Lurkers emerge from the murky waters to guard Mora's most sensitive intelligence through brute force. Seekers deceive intruders with illusions and feed off of their curiosity. Practically all we knew of Apocrypha ended there. Until, as if a great amnesia was lifted from Tamrielic academia, we remembered the shadow over Morrowind that emerged in the 582nd year of the Second Era. Hermaeus Mora has been known to take mortal champions, and during this crisis, the Gardener of Men turned to the Vestige. Through the Vestige's eyes, we can discover so much more about Apocrypha, how it operates, and the god who governs it. Hermaeus Mora's Plane of Oblivion is far more than simply a repository for forbidden knowledge. Like any library, it requires categorization. In order to do this, Mora recruits some of his most trusted followers to act as ciphers of the eye. Not only that, but new information is constantly raining down upon the realm, and I mean that quite literally. According to Leramil the Wise, the ciphers of the eye consist of mortals from Nern, personally selected and invited to Apocrypha by Hermaeus Mora. They become the caretakers and curators for the vast amount of knowledge that constantly rains down upon the realm from the rest of reality. No one knows why Mora decided to entrust mortals with this mountainous task. But soon the ciphers grew from just a few to a small army of cataloguers, researchers and librarians. They created the settlement of Cyphers Midden and established a headquarters of sorts for their members. This notion may come as a shock to you, as it certainly did for me. These Cyphers of the Eye were kept very secret by Mora, and as Laramil asserts, it is rather strange that the old antecedent would entrust mortals with such a crucial task. But after some rumination on the matter, it actually makes quite a lot of sense. Mortals are not masters of their own destiny. They cannot see the threads of fate as they become permanently stitched into reality. This makes them the perfect tools for a secretive god like Mora, who avoids revealing any information without careful consideration. You could say the same for Lesser Daedra. Why not task them with such laborious duties? Other princes like Periite certainly do in their realms. Well, Daedra cannot die, that's why. I'm going to get conspiratorial for a moment, but if a mortal cipher were to uncover some forbidden truth while curating and cataloguing the vast amount of knowledge raining down upon the realm, then Hermaeus Mora can take care of them. While there is no clear evidence that Mora would intentionally silence one of his servants, there are ciphers that become what Leramil refers to as hushed. When a mortal learns a secret too great for their intellect to contain, the mind's contents are displaced. Memories of life before Apocrypha, the faces and names of loved ones, the ambitions or desires that led the mortal to Hermaeus Mora's realm, one by one these memories are lost. Yet the first to know more drives the mortal to delve deeper still, casting aside their very self in the pursuit of forbidden knowledge. The Ciphers of the Eye refer to this siren song of destruction as the Hush, and those who succumb to this doom, they call the Hushed. The Hushed are little more than vessels for the secrets they hold, their original identities and purposes forgotten. They do not speak or interact. Most silently prowl the stacks of Apocrypha, searching out ever more obscure tomes and taking no notice of those around them. Thus, Ciphers will do more as bidding, while becoming incapable of disseminating dangerous information if they happen to overexpose themselves to it. This is why mortals are preferable to Daedra. If that forbidden truth befell a Dramora, for instance, there is always the danger of the Daedra rematerializing from chaotic creation, still wielding said intelligence. One particular Dramora, named Torvasard, will demonstrate this perilous possibility later in the video. And an interesting thing to add about Leramil's earlier claim that knowledge quite literally rains down upon Apocrypha is that it does seem to align with the beliefs of the cat folk, and with the idea that Apocrypha is in some way connected with Mundus, with reality. According to the Khajiiti silent priest Amundro, Hermora, the Watcher, Spirit of the Tides, Hermora records all the events he perceives and stores them away in a great library under the sea. The Ciphers of the Eye have their own small settlement called Ciphers Midden, 
and according to one cipher, secrets are the currency among mortals within Apocrypha. Information can be bartered based on factors like exclusivity and power. Once again, these discoveries are baffling to me, for Hermaeus Mora simultaneously considers the management of sensitive information crucial while allowing mortal ciphers to freely peruse it. I'll be doing more research on this organization, but I find it hard to believe that Mora would allow even his servants to stumble upon dangerous secrets. I believe the rumors we hear of mortals succumbing to madness are the mortals who learn too much, dealt with by the Gardener's most trusted seekers and lurkers. Another significant recent discovery is that Apocrypha is a multifaceted realm. I would compare it to Nocturnal's realm. The Mistress of Shadows has her primary plane, the Evergloam, as well as pocket realms adjacent to it, namely Shade Perilous, Crow's Wood, and the Garden of Shadows. Planes of Oblivion are reflections of their sovereigns, and prior to now, Hermaeus Mora had shown very little of his personality, beyond his role as a puppet master over mortal affairs. Before the vestige, though, we see a side of Mora that experiences doubt and regret. He reveals that, despite portraying himself as unfathomable, he is not always certain whether his interventions in fate will end in tranquility or calamity. We'll explore that more soon, but the same nuance applies to his realm of Apocrypha. Some of it we know well, but there's a plethora of subplanes and pocket realms. The Endless Library is the part Daedrologists know well, where forbidden knowledge is stored in the form of countless black untitled tomes, flurries of loose parchment, and mounds of assorted scrolls. The library is given some structure thanks to subplanes like the Tranquil Catalogue, which houses the Pool of Inquiry. By peering into the Pool of Inquiry, one may find the location of whatever knowledge they seek. Another interesting pocket is the Bastion Nimic, where Mora stores the true incantatory names of other Daedra. Nimics are a seldom discussed part of the lore, but the arcane power in names is something that cannot be overstated. Mehran's Dagon's Nimic was used by an unknown apprentice during the invasion of the Battle Spire to banish the Lord of Destruction back to the Deadlands. Mankar Cameron also refers to Nimix when detailing the transformation he undertook with Mehran's Razor, going from mortal to maker, and maker back to mortal. Dive Fear too has plenty to say on the power of Nimix. A Daedra's Nimic, or incantatory true name, as it is sometimes thought of, is not a mere appellation. They cannot abandon or change them, any more than you could abandon your body or dismiss your consciousness. A Nimic might best be thought of as a pattern or formula that defines the being created when it manifests itself from the eternal chaos of oblivion. With the right sort of magic, you can edit the pattern, alter the Nimic, and you alter the Daedra defined by it. A truly capable mage who learns a Daedra's complete Nimic could change its loyalties, limit its powers, anchor it into a different physical form, such as an object of some kind, or simply disperse it altogether. Obviously, the more powerful the Daedra and the more complex the Nimic, the more difficult it is to carry out such alterations. But that is why all Daedra fear the possibility of an enemy learning their Nimic and why they guard them so preciously. The power of Nimix and Mora's possession of them will come up again later in the video, but this is another topic that goes as deep as an ocean trench, so we'll save it for another time. Hermaeus Mora understands that some knowledge cannot be captured by words, and that knowledge dwells within the Chroma Incognito, where the swollen skies are in flux, fading from deep chumescent reds to sullen anemic hues of violet and mauve. One pocket of Chroma Incognito is the Underweave, where a vortex of raw possibility rages with the might of unrealized destinies, desperate to materialize. Another is Fathom's Drift, an ocean of waning memories and graveyard of lost ships. Superstitious sailors speak of a sinkhole in the seas of Nern, which leads the damned down into Fathom's Drift. The penultimate pocket to discuss is the most secure pocket of Apocrypha, the Infinite Panopticon, a quarantine realm of sorts. Within this labyrinth, the eyes of Mora guard the most clandestine knowledge. 
the secret knowledge within the infinite panopticon is far too dangerous ever to be shared, and is unsafe even for seekers and lurkers, should they wander its reaches for too long. There is one layer that goes beyond the infinite panopticon, and that is the mythos, the very pinnacle of Apocrypha, the nucleus of Mora and his realm. This is where Hermaeus Mora spoke the first secret of the dawn of creation. It is a crucial element not only of Apocrypha and the Lord of Fate, but also the Mundus and all reality. Glyphics within the Mythos contain the primordial secrets of the Orbis. As you can see, Hermaeus Mora's possession of so many secrets, stuffed into so many planar pockets, means that any abuse of power could potentially be cosmically calamitous. And this is where I want to delve into the concept at the core of Hermaeus Mora's sphere, fate. Bear with me, Traveller. I know we've been in Mora's realm for some time, and the weight of all these unanswered questions is oppressive. But if we can retain our wits for just a little longer, we will uncover the Great Eye's most scandalous secret. I'll let Leramil the Wise introduce the subject. She writes, Fate is the development of events as determined by a higher power. While the nature and identity of that power remains in contention, it is clear that Hermaeus Mora has dominion over at least some aspect of fate. As the ever-seeing eyes, he constantly scries the tides of fate to determine what is destined to happen next. Hence, he is called the master of the tides of fate. As far as I can tell, the one who knows does not alter or direct the way fate unfolds. He does, however, observe where the threads lead and follows them to their inevitable conclusion. Leramil's summary of fate and Hermaeus Mora's role in its realization is quite simplistic. She sees the Great Eye as an observer and destiny as an inexorable force that no entity, mortal or divine, can intervene with. My question is, even if we believe that Hermaeus Mora would not intentionally interfere, is it truly possible to perceive the branching paths of fate without implicitly altering it? Apocrypha is Hermaeus Mora's library of forbidden knowledge. I had always interpreted this forbidden knowledge to be any information that is too powerful for a mortal to learn. Take the concept of the Sigic Endeavour, the pursuit of enlightenment, breaking free from the shackles of mortality. This can manifest in many ways. Vivek is a prime example of a mortal discovering fundamental truths of the Orbis that contradict the very foundations of what it means to be mortal. If a man or elf learns of the Godhead, that they are part of a cosmic dream, they can theoretically become lucid, removing themselves from the limitation of a finite lifespan. But in other cases, this transcendental knowledge may just break a mortal's mind. If they are characters in a dream, then they do not truly exist in any meaningful way, and thus will cease to be. This notion is referred to as zero-sum. But I digress. These secrets certainly do dwell in Apocrypha. But what has only just come to light is that Apocrypha is essentially the planar repository for not only factual information, but also potential information. For every decision that is ever made, for every plot that unfolds, every fork along the winding road of fate, there are innumerable possibilities that did not occur. If Hermaeus Mora is the scryer of the tides of fate, then he must be aware of all of these possibilities. His infinite eyes watch the branches of fate split, some strands burgeoning, others wilting. Leramil uses a couple of metaphors, calling fate a loom constantly spinning out threads of destiny, or a vast ocean with currents and tides that ebb and flow forever into the future. The waters of Apocrypha are a condenser of planar potentialities. With all of this in mind, Hermaeus Mora is far more than merely a hoarder of valuable information. This information may pertain to the future of Tamriel, Mundus, even the entire Orbis. There is an extra canon source that I mentioned earlier, the Imperial Census of Daedra Lords, which claims that Hermaeus Mora was born of the thrown away ideas used during the creation of mortality in the Mundus, like the residue that remains when shapes are cut from a canvas. And given the context we've just discussed, it begins to make a lot more sense. Even the creation of the mortal realm, and all the drama that unfolded there, 
had its destiny. Lorcan battled with Auriel and Trinamac. The trickster was sundered, his heart torn from his chest. The Aedra degenerated, sacrificing their power to keep the realm alive. Powerful spirits defeated weaker ones, and as every possibility coalesced into one reality, the leftovers were thrown away, sent to rain down into the depths of Apocrypha, where the Abyss Lord and his servants would file it away. A significant revelation here is that Apocrypha seems quite unlike every other plane of oblivion because it is integral to the creation of the Mundus. And you could even argue, especially if you're a Khajiit, that Apocrypha is a tangible part of the mortal realm. In the real world, less than 10% of the planet's oceans have been explored. If the Khajiit claim Hamora's great library is at the bottom of the sea, and since we know that knowledge quite literally rains down upon the realm, is it completely out of the question that Apocrypha could be an essential part of Lorcan's creation? This would also imply that Hermaeus Mora is not subject to the oversimplified categories of Adric versus Daedric. Mora did not sacrifice his power to become an ancestor to mortals, but he most certainly took part in creation. If you stitch a garment from a sheet of fabric, the unused material was still a part of that process. Planes of Oblivion are believed to be extensions of the Governing Prince, subject to change on the Sovereign's whims. That does not seem to be the case with Apocrypha. Interestingly, the Imperial Census proceeds to say, Imperial Mananauts have verified that his influence on fate and time is real and unfeigned, implications of which tie this Prince directly with Akatosh, Chief of the Nine Divines. Since Akatosh is the prime temporal spirit whose appearance led to the formation of the world, perhaps Hermaeus Mora speaks the truth. The concepts of time and fate are inextricably intertwined. If time is linear, then every moment solidifies into reality. The threads of fate weave together, and the remnants of this providential embroidery are gathered up by the grasping limbs of the gardener in Apocrypha. There are, however, exceptions to this rule. The strands of destiny are always in motion, and at every moment along its path, destiny is transmuted into reality. In other words, shit happens, and once it's happened, it's happened. But what if linear time is broken and becomes non-linear, and a multitude of contradictory outcomes can all occur at once? This is the exact kind of event that both Akatosh and Hermaeus Mora want to avoid. I'm also going to avoid the topic of Dragon Breaks, for that little rabbit hole would cost us 51 years. But generally speaking, time is linear, meaning fate is also linear. Apocrypha is therefore the cutting room floor for unwoven fates. And to tie this in with Mora's oceanic imagery, it is believed that water is memory on Nern, which is a topic in and of itself. But if water is memory, then it is made up of completed fates, whereas unmanifested fates sink to the seabed, to the squirming bowels of Apocrypha. The unfortunate reality is, as we uncover more about Hermaeus Mora, some of his mystery and his perceived power is stripped away. He's often called the Keeper of Forbidden Knowledge, or he who records all knowledge, and he is exactly as these titles suggest, a keeper, an archivist. He does not directly determine how reality takes shape, he watches it, and he keeps records. Of course, there is still a lot of power in this role, but it does explain why the Hermaeus Mora encountered by the Vestige in Second Era 582 displays traits we typically wouldn't associate with him, traits like doubt, anger, even fear. It does seem as though the Lord of Secrets takes his role in maintaining the balance of reality quite seriously. He certainly has his motivations and ambitions, which we'll delve into very soon, but for the most part, there is a great amount of responsibility placed upon the viscid shoulders of the Prince and his servants. Mora appears to take an active role in managing the inexorable stitching of Fate's threads, preventing contradictions in reality. He must be prone to slipping up though, given the number of retcons to the Elder Scrolls over the years. Jokes aside, I've painted Mora in quite a positive light so far, emphasizing the weight of the burden he bears by keeping disastrous fates from manifesting. 
but I promise that perception will change very soon, when we excavate the skeletons from his closet. But while we're exploring his merits, I can't help but wonder if Mora has played a role in other Kalpas, and perhaps even in adjacent places like Lig. He is tied to creation and linear time after all. Lig is an example of a realm that befell a very different fate to Tamriel. Not for want of trying, of course, looking at you, Baal, and you, Dagon. In his own words, Mora is the guardian of the unseen. He not only observes the threads of fate, but untangles them. Apocrypha is an extension of Hermaeus Mora, and all the knowledge hoarded there is at his disposal. It falls upon the scryer to distribute or hide this information in the interest of ensuring fate unfolds the optimal way, avoiding dangerous fates. Perhaps in the case of Lig, Mora played the role of a spectator, trying to intervene as little as possible, letting nature take its course, more like Periite. It's a difficult balancing act. As I mentioned before, having foresight is almost as powerful as having direct control over fate. Ultimately, Lig was annihilated, set free, Numantia. Lig might have been doomed to fail, but if Hermaeus Mora possessed forbidden knowledge left over from the creation of that adjacent place, then he failed to step in and save it. This is all just wild speculation, but theorizing the role of the original spirits in adjacent places and previous Kalpas is interesting to me. Also, there are dregs in Apocrypha. In this iteration of the Mundus, in this particular Kalpa, Hermaeus Mora has not hesitated to intervene when necessary, sometimes in small ways, other times in significant ways. If he can see all the infinite threads of fate simultaneously, before they've solidified, then he can watch them progress and take action when the time is right. The Great Eye watches, but the writhing tentacles grasp and twist, making waves that inevitably alter the tides of fate. The two most significant examples of Mora's intervention involve the first dragonborn and mightiest of dragon priests, Mirak. Mirak's ambition took him to Hermaeus Mora, and the Daedra Lord offered him knowledge and power if the dragonborn would become his champion. By endorsing Mirak and bestowing upon him the power to bend the will of dragons, Hermaeus Mora drastically shifted the balance of power in Skyrim. The dragons had cruelly subjugated the Nords. One could reasonably draw comparisons between these draconic overlords and the tyrant dread kings of Lig. Much like in Lig, the slaves rebelled against their masters. Only the revolution was not quite so devastating this time around. For the victory was Pyrrhic, not total. What I find interesting is the fact that, despite turning against the dragons and their priests, Marak refused to aid the Nord heroes in their war. With the first dragonborn on their side, the victory would surely have been total. Mirak claimed that he could confidently defeat Alduin the World Eater, yet he rejected them, leaving them to their own fate. Just to add another layer to my speculation, this could have been Mora's counsel to Mirak, preventing the complete eradication of the dragons. Ultimately, the remaining dragon priests, led by Varlok the Jailer, defeated Mirak, who was rescued at the fateful moment by Mora and spirited away to Apocrypha. As for the Dragon War, the Nords resorted to using an Elder Scroll to send Alduin forward in time which conveniently takes us to Hermaeus Mora's next major intervention in Tamrielic history. Behold the Dragonborn Prophecy. When misrule takes its place at the eight corners of the world. When the brass tower walks and time is reshaped. When the thrice blessed fail and the red tower trembles. When the Dragonborn ruler loses his throne and the white tower falls. When the snow tower lies sundered, kingless, bleeding. The World Eater wakes, and the wheel turns upon the last dragonborn. This prophecy was carved onto Alduin's wall, and it is believed that it once originated from an Elder Scroll. The prophecy proved to be remarkably accurate. Not only did the dragonborn rise to save Tamriel from the World Eater, but this legendary hero was conveniently just what Hermaeus Mora needed. Merak had been plotting his escape from Mora's clutches. He had served Mora well, but the scryer needed a more loyal replacement. The last dragonborn was favoured by the Prince of Fate. 
He came to possess the Ogmer Infinium and even the Black Books, before eventually defeating Mirak. In the Prince's own words, <sighs> Mirak, I built fantasies of rebellion against me. Learn from the easy example. Serve me faithfully, and you will continue to be richly rewarded. This whole prophecy proved to be very beneficial to lucky old Homura, didn't it? It's almost as if he orchestrated the whole thing. It fits perfectly. The prophecy foretold all the threads of fate leading to the rise of the Dragonborn. It's as if Mora foresaw the future, and chose exactly the right amount of information to disseminate, influencing, but not directly controlling. This could all be chalked up to the power of the Elder Scrolls, but that's something we've yet to mention. What exactly are Elder Scrolls? Well, that's another rabbit hole I'll save for another time, but in short, they archive the past and the future. They are fragments of creation from outside of time and space. It almost sounded like I was describing Hermaeus Mora there, didn't it? Fragments of creation, privy to events that have happened and have yet to happen. Parthenax says they simultaneously do not exist, yet have always existed. Just like the realized and unrealized fates stored in Apocrypha. I'm not saying Hermaeus Mora and the Elder Scrolls are related, but it's easy to see why both are capable of creating prophecies. Despite these interventions in the goings-on of the mortal realm, I will give the prince credit. He is fairly responsible with his meddling. He seems to be well aware that unleashing the unmanifested fates housed in his realm irresponsibly could potentially unravel the very fabric of the Mundus. You need only look at mortal visitors to Mora's realm to see how catastrophic it could be. I know the existence of mortal ciphers, living in their own quaint little settlements, somewhat undermines the enigmatic side of the dreaded demon of knowledge, and makes Apocrypha feel far less sinister. But we also know that many ciphers lose themselves in the literary labyrinth. I mentioned the hushed before. Leramil states, a traveller can become lost in fates that never came to pass, strange realities that can imprison the unwary in worlds of their own making. And this sheds a new light on the dangers of exposing a mortal mind to Mora's secrets. Some mortals may find knowledge that empowers them, like Merak, who learned to bend dragons to his will. To a Dover, there is no greater insult than bowing to a human. But what about mortals who weren't Mora's champion, who voraciously pored over every tome they could reach? What if a mortal was exposed to their own alternate history? They might see a version of themselves that culminated from entirely different life choices, skewing their sense of self, until reality and unreality melt and fuse together. Could one retain their individuality in the face of so many selves? Perhaps Morian Zenus lost his grasp on the thread of fate that was his true fate. If so, his will was strong enough to prevent him becoming entirely hushed, at least as of Second Era 582 when he met with the Vestige. But the perils of wandering Mora's labyrinth are just as treacherous as ever. Zenus's cognitive decline, as well as the doomed fate of the hushed, are perfect examples of the true danger of the knowledge Mora guards. And Merak is a perfect example of the lengths Mora will go to if one's ambitions begin to threaten him, or threaten the balance of reality. With this understanding of Hermaeus Mora, it's finally time to expose his most forbidden secret. There is a forgotten Daedric Prince, only she was far too powerful, so Hermaeus Mora cast her down and erased all memory of her from existence. It has long been the accepted canon among Daedrologists that there are 16 Daedric Princes. This number relies on the assumption that Sheogorath and Jigalag are two sides of the same entity. Even Vivek in his sermons alludes to this fact. In Sermon 29, he refers to the 16 acceptable blasphemies. And in Sermon 21, when describing the Orbic Wheel, states that the spaces between the spokes of the wheel number 16, the signal shapes of the demon princedoms. But of course, the Orbis is not quite so simplistic. The monomyth details the creation of the Orbis from the interplay of Anu and Padamai, 
It speaks of all the aspects of the Orbis beginning to understand their natures and limitations, learning their place in time-space. Trying to count all of these original spirits is a frivolous endeavour. Aedra and Daedra aside, we know that Magnus had his Magnagi children, and when they fled from the Mundus, their exodus left rifts in the sky that became the sun and stars. To claim that there are only 16 princes is like trying to count all the stars in the night sky. For some time it was believed that Plains of Oblivion only existed if one of the 16 demon lords spawned them, but we now know that the number of planes far exceeds our predictions. A dread archivist in service to Molag Baal scanned over 37,000 chaos realms and pocket realities in his search for a particular kind of Lesser Daedra suggesting that many, many more could exist undiscovered. The notion that there are forgotten Daedra Lords then is not far-fetched in the slightest. However, a Daedric Prince is far more powerful than your average Daedra, and you'd expect that they would make themselves known to the peoples of the Mundus in some way or another, for the mortal realm is the hub of the Orbic Wheel. So, making a Daedric Prince disappear completely would be hard to hide. But hide it, Mora did. Her name is Ophelia the Unseen. She was the Prince of Paths, the mistress of the untraveled road, and her sphere was fate. Not the ability to perceive the threads of fate, but the ability to alter it, to shape destiny to her liking. The Great Eye scryed the tides of fate, casting his gaze beyond the present, into the future. But the threads were unpredictable, for they did not always progress organically. And that is because this one god, Ophelia, could redirect the flow at will. In his own words, The fate changer is an arbiter of chaos, who can unravel the strands of fate and rearrange them to suit her every whim. Her very existence endangers everything. Hermaeus Mora, with the weight of all this knowing wrinkling the folds of his eyelids, saw the threat to reality that Ophelia posed. It's a story not too dissimilar to that of Jigalak. The Grey Prince of Order had his own library, and according to Chamberlain Dias, this library contained a logical prediction of every action ever taken by any creature, mortal or Daedric. Perhaps this means Jigalak could even determine the destined interventions of Ophelia and Hermaeus Mora. Whatever the case, the Daedra Lords were united in their desire to rid Oblivion of the Grey One. The Demon Lords disdain order after all, for that is an Anuic trait. Jigalag says, Once I ruled this realm, a world of perfect order. My dominion expanded across the seas of Oblivion with each passing error. The other princes, fearful of my power, cursed me with madness, doomed me to live as Sheogorath, a broken soul reigning in a broken land. It seems as though Hermaeus Mora sought to unify the princes once more against a common foe. Mora explains, I gathered my fellow princes and revealed the danger I foresaw. Most agreed to aid me, some refused. In the end, it did not matter. I erased Ethelia from history. But I could not erase my own memories. Those I sealed in the three primordial glyphics. Precedent had been set among the Daedra Lords. Should a prince grow too powerful, the others will unify to thwart them. But this is where Hermaeus Mora displayed the extent of his cunning. Jigalag and Ophelia might have been more noticeably powerful, but Hermaeus Mora controlled the flow of intelligence. Oftentimes, information is more powerful than strength. Propaganda is more insidious than the blade. Subtlety and subterfuge can bypass the defenses of the most impenetrable fortress. Mora displayed once again the similarities he shares with his brother-sister Mafala. Jigalag's curse was known to all the princes, they could monitor the monotony of the Grey March, reassured that the Prince of Order would forever be doomed to raise his own kingdom to the ground, before rebuilding it as the Mad God. Ophelia, on the other hand, was cast down, 
and Hermaeus Mora erased all memory of her from history, and the Daedra lords were none the wiser. To me, this makes Mora more deadly than his infernal counterparts. Of course, Jigalag's determinism and Ophelia's dominion over the paths of fate meant that they should have been able to predict their downfalls and prevent them from occurring. But perhaps Hermaeus Mora is removed from the equation. He refers to himself as the riddle unsolvable, the door unopenable. He manifests in ever-changing nebulous shapes, roiling and mutating, and he tells the vestige that his manifestations are but aspects of his true self, for the mortal mind cannot contain the whole of him. Maybe he exists outside of the material orbits, like the Elder Scrolls, which simultaneously do and do not exist. He is formed from the leftovers of creation after all, and all fates, real and unreal, dwell within his realm, which is a part of him. If this is true, then his power far outweighs Ophelia's. Yes, she can alter fate directly, whereas Mora can only perceive it and try to influence it, constantly adjusting course as the paths of destiny twist and turn. But Mora can view her fate, and she is not immune to having the tides turned on her. How exactly he pulled it off is unclear at this point in time, but Mora's vast wealth of knowledge would certainly have prepared him for finding her weakness. I mentioned earlier the Bastion Nimic. There is a part of Mora's realm where true names are collected. What if Mora possessed Aphelius Nimic? The true incantatory name of a Daedra Lord is more complex than that of most beings, but Mehrun's Dagon's Nimic is known. Lekaloga, Jekaleho, Dabe, Ephehezepe, so it's not out of the question, and as Dive Fear asserts, one who learns a Daedra's complete Nimic could change its loyalties, limit its powers, anchor it into a different physical form, such as an object of some kind, or simply disperse it altogether. When Hermaeus Mora removed all memory of Ophelia from reality, he was the sole entity to retain awareness, or so he thought. What I find peculiar is that Mora proceeded to remove his own memory of the erasure, which he placed into three primordial glyphics. Perhaps this counters my claim that Hermaeus Mora exists outside of prophecy. Perhaps he feared that another would discover the skeleton in the closet of his mind. But I find that unlikely. Mora is notoriously cautious when it comes to disclosing forbidden knowledge. It's his whole sphere. The glyphics being discovered is far more likely than Mora's mind being read. Therefore, I find it more likely that he experienced regret, or did not wish to make a habit of erasing the memory of all his enemies. He does take pride in maintaining the balance of fate, and such a betrayal, while seemingly necessary, might have plagued his conscience. One of the glyphics contains a memory of Hermaeus Mora's debate with two princes, Veamina and Periite where he clearly shows remorse. Nevertheless, he believed there was no choice. Drastic action was needed for the greater good of reality. Hermaeus Mora's influence over reality is immense, but erasing something as substantial as a Daedric prince from memory, history, and all reality is going to raise questions. If all the Lords of Oblivion suddenly feel a chasm open in some corner of their consciousness, they will grow suspicious. It seems Veamina and Periite felt this amnesia the strongest, likely because they had argued with Mora over this proposed perfidy. But there was also a Dramora who held on to some morsel of memory, and that Dramora just so happened to be a servant of Ophelia, named Torvasard. It would appear that Ophelia had not been completely blindsided. Before her downfall, in a final desperate effort, she filled Torvasard with a divine purpose, a compulsion to right some unknown wrong. This purpose took the form of a recurring dream, which drove the Dramora to ally himself with Veamina and Periite. Together, haunted by this cavity in their memories, the two princes and Ophelia's acolyte sought answers, and this quest took them to Apocrypha. But why these princes in particular? In the glyphic of Lost Memories, Veamina reminds Mora of the Pact Primordial, an agreement between the Daedra Lords that trespassing on another prince's plane or exerting power over it is prohibited. This can and has been bypassed, but it's not encouraged. 
She also tells him that action can only be taken against a prince if all the other Daedric princes agree, and she for one does not. Not necessarily because she wishes to protect Ophelia, but instead because she considers memories to be sacrosanct. Vermina is the Prince of Dreams. She specializes in weaving illusions within the minds of mortals, making them question the nature of reality. According to Arando, She has an awful hunger for our memories. In return, she leaves behind nightmares. Not unlike a cough marks a serious illness. So, the prospect of Mora deleting memories does not sit well with the Dreamweaver. Periite adds that they cannot punish Ophelia for crimes that she has the potential to commit. Periite is the Taskmaster, the Lord of Natural Order, allowing nature to take its course, letting reality unfold as it should, for better or for worse, is fundamental to his sphere. But to Hermaeus Mora, who can trace the threads of fate and scry the future, there is no real difference between what has happened and what is destined to happen. The only way to prevent destiny from becoming reality is to take preemptive action. In a time before time, when the universe was in its infancy, Auriel, the soul of Anwiel, which was the soul of Anu, bled through the Orbis, creating a new force called Time. Time gave the Orbis structure, laying a linear path that the other spirits could use to orient themselves. This structure brought with it reality, and this reality brought with it fate, destiny, potential. So long as there was reality, there was a distinction between real and unreal, fact and fiction. Hermaeus Mora is the deific embodiment of this foundational dichotomy. There is only one true path of reality. All the other infinite branching paths lead to nowhere. In every moment, every living thing is making decisions, taking action, and each time this occurs, countless branching paths of fate solidify into reality. Years ago, I posed a theory that every hero throughout history, from the Nerevarine to the Champion of Cyrodiil, to the last Dragonborn, had a crucial fate to fulfill. But beyond the final chapter, the final outcome of their actions, we know so little about the journey. Whether they were woken up by Jib at the port of Sedanine, or crawled from the Imperial sewers, or were caught crossing the border to Skyrim, these heroes had a start point and an end point, but everything in between is obscured. So, if those heroes lived a million lives, possessed by some force from another universe entirely, perhaps that is just a simulation of all the countless decisions that were made along the way. Since the specific actions of these heroes, between the start and the end, will never be known, there's no saying which experience was the real one. Simply put, every event that does and doesn't occur, both real and unreal, ends up in Apocrypha anyway, and only serves to enhance the vast intellect of Hermaeus Mora. As we sit here in a quiet corner of Mora's Great Abyss, we are participating in this process. The waters of Apocrypha are a condenser of planar possibilities, and every drop in that inky ocean wishes to come to fruition. We've been exposed to more unwoven potential than any mortal mind can endure. I'm not sure if you can still comprehend what I'm saying, nor am I sure whether the words I speak are even comprehensible. There is still one more primordial glyphic to track down, and this glyphic will crack the case of the Forgotten Prince wide open. I'll go on ahead to find it. You should rest and digest the forbidden knowledge we've so ravenously engorged. And that brings us to the end of our journey into the Riddle Unsolvable, at least until that final glyphic is found, and Ophelia returns. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Drew the Daedrologist. You've been watching Drew Mora, and I'll see you in the next one. I walked along the bluffs of Fathom's Drift, until I reached the brink. I perched on the precipice, and a vast seascape sprawled beneath me, 
stretching on and on until its umbral undulations met a misty mauve sky, alive with veins of crimson. Seekers flitted amid the floating wreckage of ships, long since abandoned by their ill-omened crews. While the ancient fossils of colossal creatures lost to memory basked in the blush of bioluminescent barnacles. At first, my fear of heights loomed, a threatening weight pressing at my shoulders. But the motion of this undisturbed ocean induced a kind of hypnosis within me. In the span of my vision, a million ripples painted the ocean surface in random strokes. They rose and dissipated in transient flickers, catching the light of the fluorescent firmament at their apexes. And despite the sheer number of them, my mortal eyes, made for focusing, decided to single one out from the masses. There was an intimacy to it, though I could only appreciate that intimacy in retrospect, for the moment of connection had passed before I had even registered it. Had I not sat on that cliff, at that precise moment, I never would have seen it. Yet there would never be another ripple quite like that one, for every undulation on the surface of this ocean of potential is unique, its surface a constantly shifting canvas. Unlike in Tamriel, where the moons make the tides ebb and flow, the water here was still. So I sparked my hippocampus and called upon memories of home, memories that were weakening with every fading moment in this realm. I recalled the way the waves picked up momentum and crashed sporadically onto the shore. I saw the countless individual ripples that made up each wave, ripples fortunate enough to be part of something impactful. They were no different from any other ripple, equally ephemeral, yet luck and circumstance had allowed them to ride the wave, to be woven into the movement and the music of the swell. For every ripple I saw in the time that I sat there, a million more would follow the moment I moved on, and another million for every moment thereafter, again and again until the oceans dry up. I'm not sure how long I sat on that cliff's edge, perched on a stage in full view of my aquatic audience. This place wasn't subject to the strictures of time anyway, but it wasn't long. I was but a fleeting ripple in the shape of the land, a memory yet to be forgotten. How I longed to be forgotten, but the gardener of men would hoard the remnants of my psyche, even after the rest of me had faded. Somewhere in the leather-bound labyrinth, you sit and stare into the great eye of Hermaeus Mora. There is pity in his gaze. Well done, traveller. You have learned the lord of forbidden knowledge's most precious secret. But at what cost? Alien appendages extend from the folds of his distended form, and you are swaddled in his slimy caress. There is no need to cry out, for you submit willingly. Surrender your memories, your desires, your individuality, and take your place among the hushed. 